Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Adam Savitt. I'm glad to welcome you back to the Center for Security Policy for our webinar series. Remember, we do this every Wednesday at 1 p.m. Eastern time. To check the specifics of upcoming topics and speakers, please go to securefreedom.org under the webinar tab. And I'll also give you a preview of upcoming events at the end of today's broadcast. Today's program is entitled The Future of the U.S. Navy in the Biden Administration, featuring our special guests, Brian Clark and Brent Sadler, and moderated by my colleague, John Rosamondo. Please note that you are in listen-only mode, but you can submit your text questions in the Q&A box in your GoToWebinar panel, and I'll read as many questions as possible at the end of the program. This event is being recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash securefreedom, as well as our website, securefreedom.org. And with that, I'll hand it to the Center's Senior Analyst for Defense Policy, John Rosamondo. Well, I'd like to uh, thank everybody for uh, tuning in today to discuss our uh, panel uh, with our distinguished panel, uh, Brian Clark, who uh, was the author of a report for the Hudson Institute that influenced the uh, Trump administration's uh, plan for a 500-ship uh, Navy by uh, 2045. And, uh, our uh, distinguished uh, panelist, uh, Brent Sadler uh, from uh, Heritage, uh, who uh, is expert on all things Navy, who's uh, come out with a great report about uh, countering the threat from uh, China and uh, Russia in what they call the gray zone, which is the area of unconventional warfare uh, that uh, we're facing, such as uh, uh, anti-ship missiles or uh, long-range cruise missiles that uh, can be packed into uh, shipping containers or uh, Coast Guard uh, sailing of uh, shipping in uh, the South China Sea. So I'd like to start out with Brian just talking a little bit about what he sees in terms of how are we going to deal with uh, the declining budget and what are we going to do to counter uh, the threat from China, which now has the largest Navy in the world. Uh, yeah, thanks, John. And, and thank you uh, for the Center of Security, Pi Security Policy for inviting me today. It's great to be here with Brent, uh, a shipmate of mine and a classmate from National War College. Uh, so it's great to see you again, Brent. Uh, and uh, I, I do commend everybody to take a look at Brent's report um, on uh, rebuilding the Navy. It's a terrific uh, look at where the Navy is now, and where it needs to go. Uh, but to, to get to your point, John, uh, you yeah, know, we do have um, a likely you know, budget uh, set of budgetary constraints that we're going to be under during the Biden administration. Uh, there's other priorities the administration's pursuing. There's obviously COVID relief and um, the uh, the need to address the economic recession. Those are going to you know, continue to be uh, drags on the U.S. Uh, economy unless we put money against those, probably. So, so the Navy is going to have to think about how to do uh, more than it is now um, with about the same amount of money or even less amount of money. Um, I don't think that there's uh, necessarily a uh, reason to give up on the cause of arguing for a uh, sufficient budget for the Navy. So just because uh, we're going to be in this period of fiscal constraint doesn't mean we shouldn't continue to argue for more money to go towards sea power if we think that's the appropriate place for that money to go. Uh, but uh, kind of fundamentally, some things have changed uh, and that we think, you know, I think we need to take into account is. So obviously, great power competition has emerged, uh, but China and Russia are um, obviously pursuing a approach to achieving their objectives that's different than what we really envisioned from the Soviet Union, which was a more of a, you know, a, a, a existential threat that they were going to pursue uh, armed aggression of a conventional kind against their neighbors. Um, China and Russia are pretty much content to continue to use this gray zone approach to achieve their objectives over a longer period of time. That creates a challenge for the U.S. because we've tended to build militaries designed for World War III uh, and not to fight this kind of protracted uh, series of low-intensity engagements that might uh, ebb and flow in terms of how severe they become uh, because we've built a set of high-end platforms and capabilities that are really designed for you know, intense combat but are expensive to operate in peacetime and during a competition phase. And so I think what we're finding is that the need to rebalance the military and the Navy in particular to deal with competition more than conflict and maybe even take the risk if we were to balance the risk uh, in conflict. They think of, well, I'm going to take some more risk in my ability to fight World War III. It'll just be uglier and messier, but I'm going to improve my ability to do this competition phase because that seems to be where China and Russia really hang in their hats. And arguably, even as the Chinese Navy has grown, 
you could see that the, the way it's grown is one that's designed more for competition. Uh, the Chinese Navy is predominantly smaller platforms with smaller numbers of missiles that are designed to kind of keep the pressure on their neighbors and maintain a presence or, or both in the region and around the world. They have a lot lower percentage of larger combatants than the U.S. does. Um, so, so I think we need to you know, fundamentally rethink how we um, organize the military to deal with competition. And for the Navy, that gets to this idea of rebalancing. So how do we increase the number of ships so we can sustain presence overseas, keep up the the pressure on our adversaries, not offer them opportunities to uh, take a, take advantage of their neighbors, um, and also to present them a set of options at various escalations. So this idea of adaptability and optionality is something that uh, Indo-PACOM and Seventh Fleet in particular have argued that they need. And they're, they wanna build a strategy around that idea is that they have more optionality, they've got more choices at lower rungs on the escalation ladder, they can push back on Chinese uh, assertiveness and aggression. Um, so that, that, that drives us towards a Navy that's different than the one we have had. And in our Hudson study, we showed that you can even build that kind of Navy with, within the fiscal constraints of, uh, we said PB21 plus inflation, so the 2021 budget plus inflation over the, to over the next 30 years. You could rebalance the Navy and build one that's going to be effective in that competition phase, even if it accepts a little risk in its ability to fight the high-end conflict. I think Brent's study did a terrific job of highlighting how naval statecraft and naval diplomacy need to come back as a key element of how the U.S. Uh, pushes for its interests in the Western Pacific in particular. So I'll leave it at that. We can talk about more specifics uh, down the road, but I think that's kind of the fundamental change we're seeing. Well, uh, Brent, uh, that leads me to my, my question. So how do you propose using this uh, naval statecraft and uh, confronting the uh, budgetary realities to uh, mm -hmm. achieve our uh, national goals of containing the Chinese, containing the Russians, and to uh, preventing them from getting the upper hand in unconventional naval warfare. Well, th thanks again, John, for the invitation to talk today. And and Brian, thanks again for all the kind words and you know being a you know we're old shipmates. And so we've had some of these discussions over the years. So it's great to engage again in a conversation. So um, kind of the fallback on kind of it depends or it's kind of the balance. It's a little bit overstated, but it really is. The, it's a delicate art and science on how you design the future Navy to do two main things. And it's not a question of what that you prioritize over the other of these main mission areas. One is the Navy must always be able to be an effective uh, war fighting uh, capacity and capability. So it has to do that for, foremost, and it will always have to do that. Secondarily, and I would say also with the same sense of, uh, of urgency and also consequence if it's not, and that is to compete in the gray zone, this peacetime competition. And part of that is you have to figure out where it's most appropriate and how it's most appropriate. And that's really what informs this, uh, as Brian already kind of mentioned, uh, naval statecraft. It's not a new idea. It's definitely a rebranding and it's an updating for 21st century uh, challenges and threats. And I would say the first part of it is you have to narrow down your focus of you know who it is that you need to compete with. And that's number one, China, but you also have to consider Russia because wherever in the last 10 years, whenever we started to focus in on the, on the Chinese, it's diplomatic interagency and military, levers on Chinese uh, bad actions, the Russians would do something over in Syria or they would do something in Georgia and it would cause institutional distraction and resources would have to get moved over. This also occurred with uh, pressure campaigns in North Korea as well as uh, against Iran. So the Russians have a very bad habit of being a distractor at the most inopportune time. So whatever approach an enable statecraft kind of construct uh, you have to consider both and it's the Chinese primarily but it's also the Russians and it's a competition that's more than just the military by itself and that's the naval statecraft term it's it's the military the navy inside a larger construct of economic statecraft and diplomacy and, and I can kind of talk about an example of it in more detail later but this actually played out last summer and talking to the folks that were in senior policymakers and operational like military leaders at the time, it wasn't necessarily designed. And this is the West Kapala incident back in April, May, and all of the Naval and Air Force presence in the South China Sea last summer. So there's a case, there is a case to be made on naval statecraft can work. 
uh, and also another case study about the economic piece of it in a place like Djibouti, and, and I can talk more about that later. Uh, your question about, and, and to come back to one of the questions that's not getting asked enough out in the public and in the wider thought leader, amongst a, lot, a large group of thought leaders, is how does the Navy compete in the gray zone more effectively? And Hunter Stiers has written about some of this, of treating like the South China Sea as a counterinsurgency con construct. And that would, bet, that would mean within this naval statecraft, economic, diplomatic, naval uh, effort and use of levers, that you'd also have things like riot control employed on, on our warships or Coast Guard vessels that are deployed to the South China Sea. And there's a lot of interesting things that the Marine Corps and the Joint Staff have been doing in this, in this realm for a while, but it was in, to be employed in like uh, Adin or in Baghdad, uh, but not on a ship. So if you put that on a ship and you put it into the South China Sea and you have to deal with uh, tens, if not hundreds of Chinese maritime militia that are swarming, uh, swarming your ship or add in like uh, tens of Coast Guard vessels and the Chinese Navy, you have to have more tools along that lower rung of the escalation ladder. Uh, because right now that's a seam that the Chinese and the Russians have been taking advantage of. Uh, but that's not to say that if you put too much focus at the lower end, that they won't find a seam at the upper end, and that'll just shift the game again in five years. So well, let me just uh, you know, take, take it from here. I think one of the things that I'm seeing that we really need to be doing is working with uh, our allies and part building closer partnerships with the Filipinos, with uh, the Vietnamese, with uh, the Malaysians, Indonesians, Japanese, uh, and uh, South Koreans. So how do we uh, you know, work with them to uh, counterbalance uh, uh, China's uh, you know, harassment of uh, Taiwan, their uh, harass possible harassment of uh, shipping? I know that the Vietnamese uh, are very concerned about the Chinese encroachment on their uh, territory, the same with the uh, Filipinos. So how do we employ these strategies to uh, keep the Chinese off balance? Uh if, if you like, I can go ahead and take a first stab at that. I, I was recently the uh, a defense attache in Malaysia. I did a lot of work with the Japanese and, and uh, being at Seventh Fleet for years before that, I've also worked with a lot of our naval, Navy and uh, foreign partners, governments, as well as the, mili you know, the militaries. And, and the first thing I would say is whatever approach that you do, you know, you're going to have one overarching regional approach, but it has to be tailored to each audience, each country, each partner because there's so many different dynamics that are at play. Uh, and I'll give you an example of uh, Vietnam versus Malaysia. You can't use the same approach. There's a historical uh, background that has the colors, their strategic culture that's vastly different. Um, and being in Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia, the Malay strategic culture is a very interesting one of balancing too. So the first thing is when you're, when the, when the US government is going to pursue, a, you know, a more aggressive or more proactive competitive strategy, it's gotta be tailored to each of your partners and it has to be nuanced. And in Southeast Asia, I would say in particular, you don't wanna force a partner to make a public choice of we're with the US or we're with China. You don't want to force that. They'll never make that choice for one. Uh, the other side of it is, is if you just come in offering military goods, it's not gonna be compelling enough because in the Malay context, in Malaysia in particular, the South China Sea dispute is actually with Eastern Malaysia, the states of Sabah and Sarawak. They basically are not getting all of the economic goodies out of the resources they're extracting from the South China Sea, and that the Chinese are encroaching on it's even less. And part of that is because the national government there has uh, basically takes the income and then back to the capital of Kuala Lumpur and then puts it back into Sabah and Sarawak. And it creates an internal domestic political dynamic that's at play. And if you don't consider that, and the US government, the US Navy were to engage the, 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 the national government without considering that, you might find that you're gonna alienate and the government's gonna make choices that are more favorable to China. So you have to kind of make, you have to be very much aware of what the, the facts on the ground are. That also provides a lot of opportunities, but it means it's, it's in the realm of quiet military presence, which the Navy is really good at, and it's also in the realm of quiet but effective diplomacy. And part of the other part of this is 
And I said, if you're offering just military goodies, it sorts to push your partners into a choice. We're on board with the US military and their defense or security efforts. That can kind of have a chilling effect. But if you kind of also offer an economic aspect to this, and this is why I talk about economic statecraft, it allows it to also be more than just a military lever. And that actually is more likely to get partners to come on board and to join in a, in a much more comprehensive effort. And that's one of the things I saw out of the summer last year that was very stark, the reaction of the region. What do you think uh, you know, the main uh, focus needs to be in terms of uh, matching uh, you know, the uh, Chinese ability to uh, turn out uh, ships? Of course, we need to talk about quality versus uh, you know, quantity. And one of the things you know we've been discussing offline and so forth is how do we rebuild our uh, our base of uh, industrial base and be able to have enough uh, you know ship uh, facilities, whether private or uh, uh, facilities that are uh, connected with uh, the U.S. Navy, to be able to uh, maintain, build, and uh, enhance our existing. Uh, capabilities. So maybe uh, you might want to take on, take that on, Brian. Uh, yeah, so that, so uh, great point. And um, yeah, the Chinese have a very impressive shipbuilding industry. Um, they've obviously thrown a lot of money after it. Um, and have, uh, one of the things that's impressive, which is not just a matter of money, is, is how they've been able to um, use experimentation, um, go through some ship classes where they've iterated the, the ship design uh, very quickly, or in shipbuilding terms, to come up with a design that works, you know, like a look at the Lu Yang class of destroyers, where the first couple of uh, flights of that class were of you know moderate capability, and they obviously weren't happy with the, the way they turned out. But then Lu Yang three has been very popular. They've been building a lot of those. They moved on to the Type 55 cruiser, uh, the Renhai, which um, you know is a, again a, a, again like I was saying before, the Renhai has the only ship they have that is a, a number of missiles that's comparable to a U.S. Uh, Arleigh Burke destroyer, of which there's about 70 now. So so the, the, the Chinese shipbuilding industry is great in that it's been uh, very active. They've been uh, improving the quality of their ships, or at least the, the perceived quality of their ships. Um, I would argue, though, that their ship, uh, their, their fleet is still oriented towards the near seas defense mission. Um, it's, it's focused on um, missions like sea control with a relatively small number of missiles. It's not designed to go and try to project power overseas yet. That is something that's still an aspiration, even with the Navy uh, having improved in size and quality over the last uh, decade or so. So what that implies is that that is still a concern for them and that it remains a, a challenge. So I think one of the things the US Navy can do is um, you know, try to improve its ability to push back on the perception of the Chinese that their near seas are secure. So by continuing to field um, a capable small surface combatants and large surface combatants to a lesser degree, the US Navy has these tools to be able to continue to force the point on the Chinese that their near seas are not safe, they're not completely secure, they're going to have to continue to put effort there, which will divert attention away from the kinds of uh, power projection capabilities like aircraft carriers, large amphibious assault ships that the Chinese have just now begun to field. But we don't want them to feel like that can be the future direction of their shipbuilding investments because they've got the near seas problem handled. So that's part of why we're advocating you know, this shift towards a, a, a larger fleet with more combatants um, that may be smaller than their predecessors. That has an effect on the shipbuilding industry, though. So one of the benefits of this larger fleet with a rebalance towards smaller combatants is more ships are getting built. And um, even though the ships are smaller, you can distribute them across more shipyards. So now you can bring in shipyards, for example, on the Gulf Coast that currently um, you know, build uh, infrequently a Coast Guard ship or a class of Coast Guard ships. I look at places like Eastern Shipbuilding uh, or places like um, uh, the, uh, I guess now defunct um, shipyards uh, in Avondale, but smaller shipyards on the Gulf Coast that can be brought into the shipbuilding uh, industrial base and maintained at a steady level of production. Because one of the challenges today with the U.S. shipbuilding industry is um, they build ships for the Jones Act fleet, um, which is uh, now reaching the end of its recapitalization. So uh, the ships that, that ply our domestic waters and our coastal waters um, have largely been recapitalized over the last 10 years. And therefore, there's going to be this gap of production for, for the Jones Act civilian fleet. And um, the only other demand signal for those smaller shipyards is the Coast Guard and maybe some small Navy ships like survey vessels. 
Um, so if we were to rebalance the fleet, increase the number of combatants we're building, it's going to provide more business for these smaller shipyards. That's part of how you start to rebuild the industrial base is, is you come up with a demand signal that's going to spread the work out. Um, and then you have to manage it. And that's one of the things we don't do today is we don't, we don't try to manage the demand signal for government ships, for the Coast Guard, the Navy, um, and uh, you know, NOAA and some other civilian or agencies. Uh, we don't try to balance that demand with the demand coming from the commercial side or the Jones Act fleet. That could be integrated to a much greater degree than it is today. Um, and we could keep places like the Philly shipyard, um, which just uh, just about shut down last year until it finally got an order for the um, multi-mission maritime vessel that's being developed by the uh, uh, MARAD. Um, it, so that, that's one of the ways that we need to improve the shipbuilding industry is this better integration between public and private shipbuilding um, and then better integration between the different government agencies that need ships. And then the last part is this rebalancing of the Navy fleet to provide more of a demand signal for the shipbuilders. Um, uh, Brent's done some great work on the ship repair side. I, I think uh, he should talk about that. What can Congress do to help this along in terms of uh, you know, funding, <clears throat> appropriations, but and also uh, you know legislation to uh, help that along, like it's, it did uh, you know during the Cold War and during the World Wars and so forth to uh, confront the uh, current uh, state of affairs. And uh, I'll let uh, Brent, if you want to uh, take that on. Let me. I'll add one thing on that though. Is I think uh, uh, an element of this is the uh, the U.S. Merchant Marine or the um, the the surge fleet that provides sea lift in the case of a crisis uh, overseas. Uh, today, that's provided by a lot of aging ships that belong to MARAD and a small number of ships belong to Maritime Sea Lift Command or Military Sea Lift Command. Um, they're both getting ready to be recapitalized. They're both reaching the end of their service lives. So we've got 60 some ships that need to be replaced. Um, the, the, some of those need to be built new. So we're going to have to go build new ships because they're specialized ships that don't exist anywhere. Um, some of them could be bought you know, as used ships on the open market. I think that's a bad idea for the U.S. to buy used ships and have to maintain those. Um, if we're going to buy ships, we should buy them new. Um, but I think there's a huge opportunity in trying to expand the U.S. flagged fleet um, through changes to the maritime or, or to the um, maritime security program that would um, incentivize uh, civilian carriers, uh, shippers, to uh, flag their ships with the U.S. flag, uh, put them into the U.S. fleet, um, and then in some cases even build them and maintain them in the United States. So. Um, there's opportunities here to expand the demand signal for the shipbuilders and the ship repair business in this uh, non-military, if you will, part of the U.S. fleet, which belongs to Marriott and the Maritime Sea Lift Command and, and is also this U.S. flagged uh, international fleet. Yeah, uh, thanks for that. Um, I, on the question of like what can Congress do uh, and especially uh, well, one, take a comprehensive approach and a comprehensive look because Brian's uh, work on this area in the merchant marine and the sea lift aspect has brought a lot of light to things that those of us that were in uniform not too long ago, we kind of knew and struggled with. And so it's it's welcome, but it's an industry and it's a sector that's atrophied over the last 30 years, despite the best efforts of things like the Jones Act. So something new is needed, but it has to be part of a much more comprehensive maritime program. And, and that has to include what's the needs of the of the Navy, and the nation's security overseas and maritime trade, but then also what it needs to have from its merchant marine fleet in the future. And there's lots of historical anecdotes about Desert Storm and not having ships actually carry products or armaments that we needed when we needed to. We were able to overcome that, but will we always, now that we have a China in, in the calculus and a Russia, I come back to, it's both of them could be uh, at play in a future crisis, let alone a war. So I, I would add one other thing, and I know Brian has done a lot of work on this, but I would also add that, you know, the harder, the longer term investment in the merchant marine, the sea lift, it's actually not the ships, which I have strong feelings about as well. It's the people. It's the it's the maintainers. It's the workers in the shipyard, but it's also the people on those ships driving them, navigating them, maintaining them at sea. And right now we don't have we have maybe just enough if we needed to demand the ships that we would need in a war. But the average age of that group is like 46. So eventually they're going to get too old for this kind of game. And if a war comes out, they're probably also going to be too old for that game. So how do you grow the human capital? And so I, you, you, we have a gap there of about 4,500 to 4,600. 
if, if you buy into the assumption that you need to have more people than just the requirement. So that would give you about a 20% surplus of human capital investment of merchant mariners. So there, there's something that's got to be included into this national maritime program that gets to that as well. So that would be my number one recommendation to Congress is take a look at it comprehensively from the shipyards to the merchant ships, the people that are that are making those things happen, and the Navy all together, and the Coast Guard. Put that in there as well. And I would well, say that you know, Congress also should um, not resist this uh, shift to rebalance the fleet. Um, you're already seeing um, some pushback on the introduction of new smaller platforms. Um, people want to stay the course with the, the ships they have today. Um, and the, the, di the difficulty with that is that those larger ships um, have a lot of costs associated with them. And the, the service is now on the hook to pay the operation and support costs of these larger ships. So part of what the Navy is trying to do is, uh, one, rebalance because it's strategically more beneficial to, to have a larger fleet with a larger number of smaller ships. Uh, but it's also uh, a cost concern, you know, that we've got to be able to sustain this fleet down the road when maybe the, you know, the, the Congress is not as willing to cough up the money for operations and sustainment as they have in the past. Does the United States uh, then uh, look into unconventional, outside the box kinds of things? Both uh, China and uh, Russia have developed uh, containers uh, to uh, fire cruise missiles, anti-air etc. Do we look at uh, ways of uh, trying to uh, use uh, merchant vessels uh, for unconventional uh, warfare against uh, our adversaries because they're doing it uh, themselves? I, I guess I can take that first. Uh, so this is something I looked at, at uh, years ago, well, about five or six years, I worked with uh, uh, Deputy Secretary of Defense uh, Bob Work on what was called the third offset. And so there's a whole family of capabilities. But this one in particular, the containerized missiles or containerized uh, capabilities you could put on anything, there's a lot of utility in something like that. It causes your adversary, your competitor to second guess where you are and where you're not. Not in the conflict, but in the, those early phases of crisis turning into conflict. Uh, but it's uh, it basically you get to use it once. So there's 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 a utility in the early phases. But after that, I'm I'm not as I'm not as confident. Uh, I'm again I could be convinced otherwise. Uh, so there's utility, um, and it definitely in that if you limit it to that part of it. And the Chinese and the others are and other folks are looking at the same thing. So this wouldn't be a U.S. Uh, asymmetric advantage over the other side. It, but where I kind of I kind of step back and why I say it has say it has merit, it's important to, to point out that the Chinese and their Soviet kind of legacy planning construct, they're going to look at force on first, force on force rather, uh, before they commit to an activity, a military adventure. They're going to say how many of our assets versus how many of theirs. And if the correlation of forces is favorable and the second element, if they can maintain control of their forces, in other words, good C4I, command and control of their, of their forces and good uh, targeting for their anti-ship ballistic missiles and long-range uh, strike capabilities, then they're more likely to uh, launch or go off into what could become a crisis and later on to a conflict. So the key thing is you want to keep those two parts of the equation unsettled. Yeah, and I would say also um, on these containerized missiles, I think they're a great idea uh, to put them onto a military ship. Um, you know, the, the, one of the ships that we proposed in the Hudson report was this new Corvette um, that we envision carrying a missile magazine, whether it's a containerized one or it could be VLS, but that's pretty expensive to, to keep the cost down and make it more flexible. Uh, you could use a containerized missile set on the back of an operation support vessel, but that's a, it, call that a military ship. Um, the reason I say that is because in this gray zone competition, uh, we start introducing the idea of uh, merchant ships carrying containers of missiles mixed in with their other containers. We lose the narrative of being able to push for a free and open Indo-Pacific because if you're China, you're going to say, well, I get to inspect or I get to curtail the movement of merchant vessels that are carrying U.S. cargo or cargo bound for the U.S. or are U.S. flagged because you've got this missile system that you could have on there. Therefore, I can go and quarantine or blockade or or begin to uh, inspect the vessels at my uh, leisure. So, so it's a problem when it comes to the competition phase that we find is so important when dealing with China and Russia to a lesser degree.
Well, we've talked a lot about uh, China. Uh, so what are uh, some of the uh, challenges that you're, we're seeing with uh, Russia? You know, Russia has spent a lot of uh, effort on upgrading its uh, submarine fleet, and uh, Russia has been active in the Black Sea, Baltic, maybe you know, in the uh, North Pacific and Arctic. So what are some of the uh, challenges that you see dealing and uh, countering Russia? I'll just yes, uh, no, I'll, oh, go ahead, Brent. So uh, uh, one of the big challenges, um, and uh, Brent and I are both submariners, so we, we can attest to this, but one of the big challenges with Russia is the submarine force, as you said. Um, the biggest challenge is the fact that Russian submarines, even though they don't have a very many of the most capable ones, they're very quiet. And so the, the difficulty the U.S. has is uh, these submarines, you know, they'll slip out from uh, the Barents Sea, they'll drive down through the Norwegian Sea into the North Atlantic, uh, and then as we did during the Cold War, we'll attempt to intercept them somewhere around the GIUK gap so that we can keep an eye on them and make sure they don't you know, see what nefarious activities they're up to uh, because they may go do surveillance on our uh, ballistic missile base out at Kings Bay or they could go threaten the U.S. eastern seaboard. So it's important to not have these uh, very capable submarines um, uh, unlocated in the, in the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, so uh, the challenge, though, is that because they are so quiet, they consume an enormous amount of effort, uh, given our current way of doing anti-submarine warfare, uh, between P-8 maritime patrol aircraft, um, submarines, uh, destroyers will contribute to these sometimes. Uh, so there's a huge amount of effort that's, that's put against them every time they deploy one of these submarines. And when you get these reports coming back from the people doing it, it's amazing how much just time, money, uh, materials get consumed in the course of that. So we have to come up with a new model for ASW that allows us to more efficiently address these submarine threats that's scalable. Um, unmanned systems, I think, are this is a perfect example of where unmanned systems could provide that because it's a mission that's kind of slow moving. It doesn't, it doesn't happen over milliseconds like a missile engagement or even seconds like an air-to-air -air engagement. It happens over hours. You know, the decision to make a, uh, take a shot at a submarine uh, it can take hours or at least minutes to make that decision, so it's easy to have people in the loop. So unmanned systems, um, like unmanned surface vessels with towed arrays or unmanned undersea vessels with towed arrays uh, and unmanned aircraft um, deploying sauna buoys are probably a much better solution than our current way of doing that mission. So that, that to me, is the most, that's the most important challenge we need to address with Russia, is uh, reducing the ability of Russia to use submarines as a way to escalate a conflict that they have uh, going on in, in Eastern Europe, for example, because those submarines present this uh, threat off the U.S. coast, they could use as a, uh, something in their back pocket to say, you don't want to intervene or else we might take a shot at your, you know, at New York with a cruise missile. Well, one of the things I've, uh, been, I've talked with a few retired admirals and they've talked a lot about artificial intelligence. What are ways that AI could uh, be brought into uh, bear to help in uh, developing a new kind of uh, ASW and uh, encountering our uh, nearest competitors? So I'll say on ASW, so we've done, there's a, a lot of work has already gone into applying uh, AI to ASW. Um, uh, there's a lot of already existing automated target recognition. So things that we would have called AI 15 years ago are now commonplace. Uh, commonplace when it comes to anti-submarine warfare. Uh, so the, the, also the, the bar for what constitutes artificial intelligence continues to move, right? So automated target recognition would have been artificial intelligence to somebody during the Cold War. Today, it's sort of commonplace. Um, so, that, so AI is already getting incorporated into the algorithms that we use to find targets and classify those targets. Um, where uh, AI is now getting applied is in the command and control planning of operations. So for ASW as well as other operations, using artificial intelligence to build out your courses of action um, that you could use then to deploy your forces and then manage them in real time. So that's that's kind of the next step where artificial intelligence is getting applied, it, particularly for the ASW mission. And then you've seen reporting in other missions like air and missile defense as well. Um, but I'll turn over to Brett. Yeah, the, the other piece of this, it's really making it more and more pop. There's actually, there's, if you look at robotics, there's, there's a third element. But if you just look at the, the brains, the, the processing of data, digitalized data, and that's really the more, the more of your sensed world can be digitalized, the more likely, and there's a, there's a critical threshold when you cross over the amount of information that you have digitalized and sensed in the analog world, 
that you actually have a step increase in ca capability and, and uh, sensing capacity and your speed of action goes up markedly. Knowing where that break point is is kind of key. And uh, there's lots of work on what that is in, in very niche markets and niche things. Uh, but when you're talking about multiple domains with cyberspace, sea, subsea, and the air, the amount of data and sensors you have to put in to get the real full benefit of the big data analytics that AI then can advantage you, uh, it, it's the, you have to have enough sensors of digitizing and then our network. So there's a piece of this that's also inherent in the artificial intelligence. But that also presupposes, and this is what's making this more and more possible, one is the capa ca capability of good sensors, like radars, optics, uh, heat sensors, and then in the future, quantum sensing, which is I think has some really interesting implications. Uh, but the sensors are one part. The other is, and this is the most important one in my mind, your processing power. And this is, quantum computing is probably the next step, very likely the next step, when you have massive amounts of parallel processing of all of this data, and then you have an artificial intelligence algorithm that's in analyzing and looking for patterns of behavior in massive amounts of data, you can not only just report on what you're seeing more intelligently, but you can then do predictive analysis. And that is in the ASW world, you can say, okay, what we're seeing now based on all of what our sensors have seen over the last five years is that you're gonna wanna move your ships and your sensor network over here. And that's that's part of, I think, what Brian's getting at. It's part of where the, the military, not just the Navy, but you know through the Joint Artificial Intelligence Center, they're kind of moving to in this C2 uh, benefits of AI. But there's a lot more to it than that. I mean, that's, well, that's the most promising in the near term. One of the things that has been of concern to me is uh, China's anti-ship uh, ballistic missiles, uh, you know, which fires from ranges beyond uh, the range of uh, our uh, Aegis uh, system. What are ways that uh, the Navy uh, can work with um, you know, Space Force, you know, employ AI and so forth? For uh, long-range uh, fleet defense, no doubt, uh, you know, Russia might or even Iran could get into uh, the game of uh, anti-ship ballistic missiles, which is an uncharted uh, territory going from what we've had in the past. Uh, yeah, so uh, uh, anti-ship ballistic missiles are um, are a problem, and again, it's it's back to the original competition discussion. Is it's more of a strategic weapon designed to shape the behavior of naval forces out in the region. You know, so. Uh, Anti-ship ballistic missile, for example, isn't going to sink an aircraft carrier, uh, but it could damage some aircraft on the aircraft carrier's deck, which means it's you know, no longer able to do its mission, right? So, so the the threat of that causes the aircraft carrier to change the way it it operates. It reduces the ability of the carrier to impact the operations inside the South China Sea because it it takes so it's so far away now that it it, it may not be able to reach that region with airplanes from the carrier. Um, so the Navy's approach is to go after the entire kill chain to try to take away the ISR that allows the, the Chinese to be able to target the carrier or reduce the effectiveness of that ISR. Um, and th you know, that approach certainly has a lot of merit because it's sort of, you, you, you chip away at every piece of the uh, communications, uh, the sensing, uh, the command and controls uh, that, are allowed, that allow the Chinese to use that anti-ship ballistic missile effectively. Um, what we're finding though in, in, is of course, that's, that's going to be a, it may be a losing game to some degree as the Chinese continue to shore up their ISR and communications with more redundant systems um, that prevent it from being completely lost. So it turns to us to then have the ability to engage these threats uh, in flight. Um, and one thing we're finding is that the space, the space layer is going to be increasingly important to providing the ISR and targeting for missile defense, uh, not just for anti ballistic missiles, but also for hypersonic weapons. Uh, they could be hypersonic air breathing weapons, as well as hypersonic boost, boost glide weapons that behave kind of like an ISH ballistic missile. So, that, so the idea of the, of the space layer, um, it used to be sort of a, a, an intelligence tool and a communications tool. Now it's going to be a tactical targeting tool with a lot of the new work that's being done by the Space Development Agency um, and the Space Force. Um, so we have to think of it now as a part of the kill chain in the same way we would have treated the E-2 Delta Hawkeye um, you know, airborne early warning aircraft. Um, the space layer is now the, the primary source for targeting for that missile defense mission. So we got to have the command and control that allows you to use that and the communications that allow you to link up to it. Um, but uh, that's what we're finding in terms of naval operations overall is that that space layer becomes your first source of ISR and targeting. Uh, and then you rely then on aircraft 
Uh, and then maybe then you rely on your organic uh, sensors on your ship uh, or on your submarine. Uh, Brent? Yeah, John, if I can. I, so at the high end in the con conflict, these are all very, very important things to consider. But again, it's it's a it's a there's two demands on Navy now. There is that high end war fighting capability and consideration. But increasingly, you have to think about what are the implications in the gray zone, the crisis realm, the peacetime competition. And so if the aircraft carriers, the Navy go back to how they were operating in the 70s, where they tried to stay outside of a thousand miles of the Soviet coast out of the North Atlantic, because of similar threats, it wasn't the same, but similar threats, then that actually has a peacetime strategic cost where you don't even, you win by without without fighting. And, and that's definitely what the Chinese are doing. And that's part of what Brian, I think was getting at when it changes the behavior of how we operate. There is a peacetime consequence if we operate that way in peacetime. So it ha you have to be, a, a, you know, be able to go in alone and unafraid into the A to AD uh, meat grinder in the South China Sea and the East China Sea and, and do it frequently. Uh, the things that uh, come to mind that have to be more invested in to make that, uh, even in that crisis where there might be some limited shooting and some ma very managed violence, you're going to want to have things like high energy lasers and you're going to want to have rail guns uh, that are being used and employed for ballistic and cruise missile defenses. So that's, that's, that's coming down the line, I hope, in the, in the, in the very near future to midterm. But you're going to need to see more of that, especially with your large assets that are going to operate inside that first island chain. Uh, the other thing also to kind of pivot back to the Russians just for a second, this doesn't apply to the Chinese uh, uh, construct. They have very different kind of strategic constructs in, in the peacetime competition. And you can see that by just the way that they, they try to influence our elections and our political life in the United States, vastly different approaches. The Russians in this peacetime competition, you were asking about where do we have to, you know, where do we need to worry about and what kind of activity? It's uh, for the Russians, it's mostly, you know, the, the nexus or the fulcrum of their activities, I would say, is in the eastern Mediterranean, uh, centered on right now in Syria, but increasingly moving down to the Red Sea and Port Sudan, where they just got access rights. So you, you're going to have to, if you focus your, your, your activity, your naval activity in that area, it's probably going to get Putin's attention. And it's probably going to start to complicate their early phase of their strategic actions. And if you look at Gerasimov, did a, you know, their general staff, but he actually has this thing called the Primakov Doctrine, where they actually try at the early stage of a crisis or to make a strategic move, they try to sow discord on the target or the target country or the target population. And the key thing is not allowing them to start trying to sow discord or to expose hypocrisy. If we are a treaty ally to a country, but yet we're unwilling or unable to intervene on their economic exclusive zone rights, either in principle or uh, materially, then that starts to sow doubt in your in the target country, and that's exactly the early stage of a conflict or a crisis. That's where the Russians are going to start to draw apart. And if you're present, not, you know nine tenths of the law is possession. If you're present, nine tenths of the game is won with the Russians. So, what can NATO do in the Black Sea region? Uh, uh, together with, say, Romania and uh, Bulgaria and even uh, Turkey to uh, remind uh, Vladimir Putin that we can act with impunity in what he considers his home waters. Yeah, it's, well, that's, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. that's a tough one because you've got the Montreux Treaty um, right. going on as well. So there's only so much uh, that you can put into the Black Sea because of that. But um, there, there's, there's other things that can be done. The Navy needs to be there as much as it can and so should NATO and NATO members. But um, there's certainly a very lively debate going on right now. There's a case that's sitting with, uh, with the UNCLOS, with, U with the UN right now about the uh, illegal activities of the Russians around uh, Crimea. But uh, I'll turn that over. I mean, that's on the diplomatic lawfare side of the house, but I'll turn back over to Brian. Yeah, the Montreux Convention you know, limits the tonnage of ships and the kinds of ships that you can, you can put into the Black Sea if you're not a resident power. Um, so that means that U.S. should be working through NATO to help bolster the naval forces of those resident powers. Um, so the Romanian Navy um, can be a bigger player there to push back on Russian uh, assertiveness. Uh, the Russians are doing this very interesting thing of uh, essentially home basing Kilo submarines uh, in the Black Sea be because they say that they're there for a voyage repair period, uh, even though they're technically not supposed to be based there. Uh, so, you know, anti-submarine warfare operations could be conducted, you know, through the Dardanelles, 
um, through using aircraft. There's no limitation on the use of aircraft in the in the Black Sea. So uh, using aircraft, either manned or unmanned, to conduct anti-submarine warfare in the Black Sea would be a way to make the Russians understand that they they cannot operate with impunity in what is international waters still, uh, and that there are NATO neighbors uh, nearby. So there's a couple of tools that the U.S. has still in its its kit bag uh, that it can use to push back on the Russians in in the Black Sea. But but yeah, it has to be a little more creative um, than it has in the past, and it does demand. Um, you know, an emphasis on some of these other platforms that are not necessarily the high-end things that we are used to organizing our fleet around. So, uh, I mean, where do we uh, see things going in the next uh, five years in terms of, uh, you know, the Biden administration? How will uh, the Biden administration impact our uh, calculation? Do you uh, see that uh, they'll under, understand uh, the threats that we're uh, up against, or do you uh, think they'll be more interested in other uh, priorities? Well, uh, so in my discussions with them, it's clear they understand the threats and they, you know, uh, obviously uh, Cat Hicks and, and uh, uh, the folks that they brought in at the lower levels that are not yet political appointees uh, are really well versed in the challenges posed by Russia and China. Um, what I think uh, you're going to see are the same themes we saw in the shipbuilding plan that the Trump administration had submitted, you know, that we, we contributed to, uh, maybe, but just not at the same level. So instead of buying uh, 80 some ships over the next five years, we might buy 50 ships, but it'll still reflect that same uh, set of themes. So rebalancing to increase the number of increase the number of smaller combatants, uh, number of frigates, for example, the number of um, corvettes or optionally unmanned uh, vessels uh, that are that are currently called large unmanned surface vessels. Uh, increase the number of um, uh, unmanned uh, undersea vessels. Um, maybe reduce the number of uh, large surface combatants like DDGs. Um, and increase the number of uh, smaller amphibious warships. So you'll still see those themes, I believe, reflected. It's just that they may not be at the scale. Uh, and in particular, one thing that the Trump administration injected at the end was a massive increase in the number of submarines uh, in the fleet. I think that's largely going to get removed by the Biden administration um, as they uh, you kind of look for ways to reduce the cost of the shipbuilding budget. Uh, and that's one way that you can do it. Um, aircraft carrier construction will probably remain more or less on the same pace. It might get extended slightly from its current five-year centers to maybe five and a half or six at some point. Um, uh, but I do think that that it's going to reflect the same themes. Um, we can talk about some of the challenges uh, in the the warfighting side of the of that shift in the fleet balance. But um, I think that rebalanced fleet, at least from the war gaming that I've contributed to and been part of. Um, can still be very effective, even in the conflict phase against the China or Russia, uh, and it gives you more tools down at the lower end of competition. So I, I think there's, there's, you know, there, there's going to be a benefit to the direction that the Biden administration goes, uh, even if they do it under a smaller top line than may have been originally envisioned under the last year of the Trump administration. Well, what so, do you think should be the priority? Uh, so for me, I think the priority is comp comprehensive competition with China and Russia. I think that should be the priority. The, the national priority should be that because the consequences, and we're already seeing it uh, in our media that we digest here at home, we're seeing people's livelihoods be affected very directly. I mean, there's example, I mean, the example of the Marriott manager being fired because he liked to tweet for Tibet uh, is just one example of many. There's the NBA and there's quite a long list, Confucius centers, nefarious influence peddling throughout our universe. I mean, there's a long list. So they're here. They're here now. They've been here for quite a while. Um, and there needs to be an awakening and awareness, realization that real action is needed in this great power competition because it's on our shores. The homeland's not an island. It, it's where the front line is, is in your living room on this one. Um, but I would have to say, I, I have some difference of opinion and, and I would have to say that the jury is still out for me as to the direction this administration, the new administration, Biden team is going to take. Um, there's still no Secretary of the Navy named. That will be a very big tell to me as to you know the commitment one way or the other. Uh, I'm not sure who that will be. So that's one. The other is that a lot of these folks, like Brian had mentioned, they've been around. They were in the second term of Obama, and there was a couple of events in the South China Sea, 2012 in Scarborough Shoal, where. A Few of these few of these leaders, policymakers, uh, their assumptions about China were proven woefully inadequate, and they admitted one of the most notable notable in this is uh, 
uh, Kurt Campbell noted their, their, their basically their false assumptions. So I can only hope that as I go forward that they keep that wisdom and they have a very realist approach to the Chinese as they go forward. Uh, the rhetoric right now is not clear. I mean, there's some good mixed in with some not so good uh, words and actions so far, but it's still too early in my mind. Uh, the other is I would just want to point out that I know with $1.9 trillion COVID bill on the docket, just to point out that $900 billion of the last stimulus has yet to be spent. So while there's a massive uh, debt and that's being generated, uh, I'm not so sure what the, the, the downstream consequences yet are going to be if, if all of it's not realized, that spending is realized. The other part of it is that I would say is despite all of that, and let's say that the debt does go up dramatically, there will be a tendency to cut down budgets. But what I've seen is an, a very much, as we want to cut down the military, we want to increase spending uh, much more dramatically in other areas, entitlements and things. So you're not going to save anything by cutting the military. It's also a small fraction of the overall federal budget, too. Uh, when it comes to the Navy, I also like to point this one out, that in the height of the Cold War, when we were building up, we were going through a massive buildup of the Navy, we spent upwards of 6% of our GDP on the military. At the same time, our economy was booming throughout the 80s. It averaged three, a little bit over 3% GDP economic growth throughout the 80s. And that began in 80 to 81 with a really bad recession. There was a recession in the middle. And we peaked at, I think, a little over seven and a quarter percent in 84 economic growth. At the time, we were spending six or a little bit over 6% of our GDP on the military. Today, throughout the post-Cold War era, we've spent on average just shy of 3% of GDP on the military, and our economic growth has kind of flatlined about two, about two and a half percentage points throughout that time. And that includes two major wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. So I, I always kind of go back and say, I'm not sh I, I think we have a lot more depth, economic and innovation and capital that we can tap into to build the Navy, specifically we're just talking the Navy, to build the Navy that we need to compete effectively with the Chinese and the Russians. And part of it is getting into the mind of Xi in Beijing and Putin in Moscow to affect their strategic calculus too. Um, and the last, thing I, the last thing I wanna say on this is, there's a lot of new capabilities, new technologies that are all kind of coming up at the same time, both in bioengineering, genetics, over in the world of artificial intelligence and robotics, in the maritime world, if you can bring those all together in such things as unmanned uh, undersea and, and surface vessels, you might be able to spark the imagination and the excitement of younger generation to enter into government and enter into the military to design and engineer the future of the fleet. There's a lot of really cool and interesting things to come. And there has to be an element of this with new leaders that I, I haven't seen it yet, but there's a lot of potential there to spark the imagination and the creation of the nation or creativity in the John, uh, we get some uh, audience, audience questions in here? Sure, let's shoot. Sure. Okay, excellent. Um, in rebalancing with limited budgets, what about the concept of building non-nuclear submarines? Uh, so I would say, yes, I'll take, <laughs> I'll take it. But the, uh, uh, so we've normally, we've normally consider that to be a bad idea. Uh, I'll just say straight up, one problem with that is um, to get a decent non-nuclear submarine that's got the kind of combat capabilities of our nuclear submarines, um, you're looking at a billion dollar plus uh, conventional submarine. Uh, so you're gonna, it's less expensive obviously than a Virginia class, um, uh, even a current Virginia class, um, but you're gonna spend a billion dollars on a ship that you're gonna have to then base probably overseas to try to uh, make up for the fact that it's going to have a slower transit um, and have a shorter endurance uh, than a nuclear submarine. Um, and you've got a lot less flexibility now in terms of how do you deploy it. So one of the things that the U.S. sort of depends on in its operational planning is the fact that submarines can sprint if necessary, you know, I guess, what, what are we, what's the tech, it's more than 20 knots <laughs> uh, to try to get to a place uh, where conflict isn't getting ready to occur. Um, you can't do that with a conventional submarine. Um, and if you're a global power, uh, you need to be able to mass uh, forces at the location of a potential confrontation. Um, having a submarine force that is uh, slower um, and uh, has less endurance is not going to be beneficial to you. And you're still spending a relatively large amount of money on it. So that money would be better spent 
buying the nuclear submarines or buying surface combatants um, that could do some of the missions that submarines would otherwise do. So um, uh, one thing that we, we often fail to recognize is that submarines, even though they can launch cruise missiles, um, they also um, put themselves at risk when they do so. So it's not a mission they can do for a long time. A surface combatant, on the other hand, might be better able to launch those cruise missiles and fight, you know, stand and fight, uh, whereas a submarine doesn't have that same ability. So, so I think that's just, uh, there's a lot of reasons why a conventional submarine does not make sense there. Brent? Yeah, I would just add, um, if you're going to get invest into conventional undersea capabilities, it's better money spent on the unmanned smaller uh, undersea vessels, because the other place where a large nuclear submarine with its endurance and all the benefits that Brian mentioned, shallow water is not fun to operate in. And I'm talking water that's shallower than the length of the submarine, so 300 feet or less. And there's a lot, there's continental shelf is pretty shallow all along the East and South China Sea. That's not a fun place to operate in when someone's trying to kill you or to find you in peacetime. Uh, so I would say that'd be better investment, more of the unmanned, uh, rather than trying to develop uh, diesel submarines. And there's, there's you know, naval reactors, it's an anthem to even mention this in the halls of naval reactors. Um, but uh, there is a human capital aspect of this as well. Um, the submariners that would be in the conventional submarine force may not be completely interchangeable with the submariners that are in the nuclear fleet. So there's a, there's a human cost as well. Uh, the question or notes, uh, Columbia class boats are top priority in spending, but only two US ship shipyards are capable of producing them. Um, but let's just expand that out. They ask, is there something about a shipyard location besides op obvious death issues? So maybe, you know, are we limited in, in our capacity to, at building shipyards or the right kind of shipyards? I, so uh, no, um, you could uh, start a greenfield uh, shipyard to build nuclear submarines in theory. It's just very expensive. You know, so just building the infrastructure to support that having all the controls in place to have nuclear material, um, have the proper material controls and cleanliness for a lot of the, the, the manufacturing work that has to go on. So it's just a big capital investment. Um, and right now the demand for the, from the Navy for submarines is such that um, we're probably lucky to have two shipyards building submarines uh, if we're only building two or three per year. Um, and so that's, uh, I think that that's one part of our industrial base that's probably a good size because uh, you could expand the capacity with some investment. Uh, rather than trying to build a third shipyard somewhere else. Now, I will say, um, back in the Cold War, we had multiple, we had, I think, two more shipyards that built nuclear submarines. I served on a submarine that was built down in uh, the Gulf Coast. And so, um, yeah, that that was not an unusual event back then, but we had a demand signal for uh, four or five submarines a year then. All right, John, if you just want to wrap up real quick, and I'll do some announcements. Well, I just want to thank everybody for, uh, and especially uh, Brian and uh, Brent for their uh, insightful uh, look into the status of the U.S. Navy, its threats, and where we're going in uh, the Biden years and beyond. Uh, it's been a, a great experience, and I hope that everybody uh, watching has uh, enjoyed and found everything informative. Thanks, John. Um so our upcoming events uh, next week, March 3rd, the growing politicization and weaponization of U.S. intelligence, moderated by our center president, Fred Flights, and featuring author Bill Gertz and Ambassador Peter Hoekstra. The next week, March 10th, is a book release uh, from the CSP Press. That's Qatar's Shadow War, how the tiny Gulf state of Qatar built an outsized influence in American politics by author Dave Reboy and moderated by our Kyle Scheidler. Uh, remember, the center's important work is only possible because of your support. If you're enriched by these webinars, please click the red Donate button on the Center for Security Policy website for information on how to contribute or make an instant contribution by credit card. Uh, thanks again to our guests, Brian Clark and Brent Sadler. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next week. Thanks a lot.